from the entertainment capital of the world. I'm Christopher Calloway, and this is Creator Talks. My guest today is Danny Fingeroth. Danny was the group editor of Spider-Man comic books during the 1980s. He was also the author of The Deadly Foes of Spider-Man in the 1990s and Lethal Foes of Spider-Man, and also wrote the entire 50-issue series of Dark Hawk. He wrote Dazzler and other comics, and he has a book about Stan Lee, the amazing story of Stan Lee, A Marvelous Life, and we're going to discuss that book today. NPR Book Reviews says of the book, A Marvelous Life gives us strong insights into the forces that drove Lee and Marvel to success. A must-read for anyone who wants to understand how Stan Lee set Marvel on the path to world domination. Publishers Weekly wrote, In this enthusiastic biography of Stan Lee, Fingeroth, one-time writer and editor at Lee's longtime employer, Marvel Comics, tells the story of the man who helped create comic book legends including Spider-Man and Black Panther. This biography is a fittingly ebullient tribute to a man who never failed to add one more exclamation mark. This is a sure hit for comics fans of all camps. I'll begin my discussion with Danny about how he broke into Marvel Comics, working with Larry Lieber, Stan's brother, then moving on to editing the reprint line, and of course discussing the book, talking about Stan, working with his collaborators such as Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Don Heck, and many others. And then, of course, I'll kick back with the creator, talking to Danny about his favorite birthday, his island book, beverage of choice, who was Stanley to him, and a whole lot more. So let's get started. My discussion with Danny Fingeroth, author of The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, A Marvelous Life, here now on Creator Talks. Danny, welcome to Creator Talks. Uh, great to be here, Chris. You started at Marvel, wow, it was back in 76. 77. 77, okay. My Wikipedia page is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> about a number of things. Well, I'm glad you cleared that up. I don't want to seem even older than I am, you know. <laughs> but that wasn't the first time you were there, was it? You went there when you were much younger for a visit. <laughs> uh, yeah, when I was about 12 years old, I went up there uh, with my friend uh, David, who was a classmate, a guy named David Sable. We tried to bluff our way past Flo Steinberg, who was Stan's secretary and was guarding the front door. And uh, we didn't get anywhere. She was very nice. She gave us, as I recall, some uh, pinup, some black and white pinups color if we wanted. There was one that had been a Fantastic Four pinup in one of their early annuals, I think. And that's kind of most of what I remember about that experience. It was pleasant, and I remember kind of looking through. Maybe there was either somebody to open the door, or maybe there was a window, and I saw that giant... Spider-Man poster that they were selling. It was one of the first Marvel pieces of merch back in the 60s. They teased it at first by saying, can you guess what's in the mysterious mailing tube? And it was a giant poster, which I always thought was by Ditko, but actually it was based on a Ditko pose, but it was so large, I think Marie Severin had blown it up and done it that huge. It was a poster size of like six feet tall, literally. You would return to work for Marvel. Actually, you started working with Larry Lieber, and that was the Marvel British Department. And we don't know a lot about Larry compared to Stan, of course. What was it like, your first job there, and working for him? Larry has done many interviews over the years. If you Google him, there's probably a half a dozen in-depth interviews with Larry. So if people don't know about Larry, it's only because, you know, he doesn't have the celebrity glitz that Stan had. But I would say Larry's life is not a mystery. <laughs> he was great to work with. He's actually a good friend of mine currently. I see him, uh, I have lunch with him a couple of times a month. He was great. Unfortunately, I guess, he was in the business where his brother was the most famous person that ever lived. So even as talented as Larry was and is, that's always going to create complications. He was a great person to learn from. I had been a comics reader and a comics fan. You know, I only had the vaguest notion of what a comic book editor did and even what a comic book writer kind of did. And Larry really was one of, you know, my main mentors in the business. A very gifted writer and artist and editor himself. He is nine years younger than Stan. 
and he'd uh, been working in the business pretty much his whole adult life and a lot of his teenage life, too. I enjoy his work very much. I've been uh, reading through a lot of the westerns that he did. He liked working on the westerns. He wrote and drew The Rawhide Kid. did a lot of other stuff, too. Obviously, he was the co-creator of uh, Iron Man, Thor, Ant-Man. You know, he wrote the initial origin stories based on brief outlines that Stan gave him. So he uh, liked sort of the niche of the Western stuff because he didn't have to worry about keeping up with continuity. And, you know, I think there was a solid readership for those books that didn't really vary that much. It was just Larry knew that he had an audience and people would be buying it regularly and he could just sort of not have to be concerned with, you know, what the latest thing the Hulk was doing, who was guest starring in the Fantastic Four or whatever. And later on, you became editor of the reprints for Marvel, and you would think, well, how difficult can that be? The stories are already done. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that easy. So tell me something about overseeing the reprints, what you were overseeing, and what some of the challenges were. Well, you know, it's, I worked in that British department for about a year and a half or so. And then the uh, British books went over a guy named Des Skin, who uh, was an English publisher, took them over, and Larry moved over to do the uh, Hulk newspaper strip. I had sort of a multiple responsibilities then, and one of them was the reprint titles. I would say that the challenge was to take a 20 or 22-page story and fit it into 17 pages. Your listeners may faint when they hear this. I had to chop out panels from stories and kind of write bridging text. So a, a lot of those reprints were not exact reprints. They had some pages that were shuffled and panels that were missing. I will confess something to you that I did because I did not come from fandom. I had been a big fan as a kid and loved the Marvels and was in that first wave of Marvel readers in the 60s. My late teens drifted away from comics and, well, from Marvel. I was still into comics, more of the underground and independent type stuff. So what I did was there was sometimes there'd be a scene in a story that I was reprinting and if, like, there were two guys robbing a bank and they were calling each other by name, I would white that out and put in names of my friends. <laughs> now I go, well, I guess that probably violated, like, a hundred different continuity rules, but I just thought, oh, will, these are guys who are just there for Iron Man to beat up or something, and nobody's going to ever see them again in, you know, in any other story, so I'll just substitute my friends' names, and that'll be, we'll all get a big laugh out of it. <laughs> 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 but I, I'd say the biggest challenge was figuring out what to delete that would not ruin the stories, although I guess some people hear that and go, well, that ruins the stories automatically. Uh, and then there was some in the British department, actually, we did mostly reprints, so I learned how to split up stories and how to find a page that ended on a something of a cliffhanger, and then we'd do a new splash page for when the next weekly installment would appear. And I did that for, I think it was Amazing Adventures was the uh, X-Men reprint, because those stories were way too long. No way really to chop those up gracefully, so, to delete stuff gracefully, so we would split them in half. And I'd have a new splash page and a new cover done for the second half of the story. And then we, in the backups, we put in some of those X-Men origins that had been backups in the X-Men in the 60s. What was you know funny to me in those days, Carmine Infantino did a lot of the splash pages for me because he was under contract and in order to fulfill the contract he needed just to do a certain number of pages each month. I got to work with Carmine there and also on the Star Wars uh, weekly comic that was put out in Britain because he was the artist on that. That was sort of among my first experiences with kind of working as the alleged supervisor of one of my childhood idols. That was definitely strange. I do remember those amazing adventures, too. I did buy those and collect those, and I love those books. So you're old, too. <laughs> yes, I, oh, yeah. yes, I am. <laughs> I am mature. <laughs> yes. I think, I think John Byrne did a couple of covers. Usually, even the most busy or most popular artists, they actually like to do one-offs like a cover because that can sort of give them a break from what their main thing is, but it only takes you know a day or, or whatever to, to do it. And that was fun with the, the reprints. That and the British line was a good way for me to catch up on continuity of comics that I'd missed in the years when I wasn't reading them. And eventually you became group editor of the Spider-Man titles, which must have been a big thrill for you, a real opportunity. Besides, of course, writing Deadly Foes and Lethal Foes of Spider-Man. What was one of the first 
Spider-Man books that you read on your own. Oh, Amazing Spider-Man number one. Oh, wow. You were there from the beginning. Well, I wasn't there. I didn't have Amazing Fantasy 15. I was reading comics, maybe even Fantastic Four, but I remember distinctly buying Amazing Spider-Man number one, maybe because they talked about it in FF and it had the FF on the cover. So that trick does work, apparently, putting a popular character on number one issue of somebody else's book. My first Marvel that I knew was a Marvel was Fantastic Four number four. I think I'd been reading... Oddly enough, Millie the model in my local barber shop, because in those days, <laughs> uh, barber shops had a box of a cardboard box full of old coverless, torn up comics, you know, to keep kids, you know, from um, jumping around while they were getting a haircut. So somehow I remember reading Millie the model, not knowing that it was the same people who were also doing the Marvel superhero comics, but you could see the ingredients. I mean, what Stan did so brilliantly was to combine genres. He loved writing humor. He loved writing, you know, romance and funny animal stuff. He took a lot of different genres. And, of course, obviously he did this in collaboration with Kirby and Ditko and with Larry and with John Romita and Don Heck, Dick Ayers. Now, with all his artistic collaborators, they had all drawn and written a gazillion comics in many different genres. So really, those Millie the Models were unknowingly my first Marvels. And then soon after, a friend of mine at school had read the Fantastic Four and said he should try it. And I did, and I was hooked. And so going on to work there, you know, as I said, I'd sort of drifted away. I wasn't really reading them regularly, but it seemed, you know, I came back. I had gotten kind of a fine arts degree in college and you know like young people do and i graduated college i came back home and it happened for me home was in new york city i had a very enjoyable enriching education that was totally impractical um and i thought well what am i going to do now and i thought oh it might be fun to work at marvel comics and i didn't have a contact to get in there but i knew somebody who could get me in the door for an informational tour and once i was there i, I did run into someone i knew who was working there and that ended up in me uh, getting that job uh, as Larry's assistant. To be working you know, as the editor and also sometime writer of this character that Stan and Steve and John had made so iconic was fun. It was a lot of pressure. I mean, in, you know, in some ways, Spider-Man seems like he'd be an easy character to write or, or, or edit because he's so uh, well-known. But it's really hard to do him... Right. A lot of people can do a passable Spider-Man, but there are many few people who can do a great Spider-Man and give you some of that same feeling of uh, what Stan and Steve and Stan and Johnny did. You know, the character, it's easy to kind of flip into morose or guilt-ridden mode with Spider-Man and forget that he's a multifaceted character. Even when it's terrible, it's fun to be Spider-Man, and it's fun to read about him. I don't want to judge my own writing. I think, I mean, sometimes I hit the mark, sometimes I didn't. But as an editor, it was always great to be reading a, a story, you know, to be editing a story that was done by people who really got the character. You know, that would be Roger Stern, Tom DeFalco, J.M. DeMattis, Ron Friends, uh, both Romitas, Mark Bagley. You know, I'm sure I'm leaving people out, but these were people... Um, who really got what made the character so multidimensional and so popular for the past 60 years. And he was co-created by Stan and Steve Ditko, and Stan established that character, and you have written a book, Stanley, A Marvelous Life. I'll just be nitpicky a second, because officially the title is A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee. So if someone is looking for it, even as they're listening, if they should happen to be you know, ordering it online or contemplating it, it's A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, from St. Martin's Press, Macmillan. <laughs> even as we speak, although not literally, but these next couple of weeks, I'm going to be recording the audio book. So the print is out, and the digital version of the book is out. But the audio book will not be out till January. But then, if you think it's exciting to hear me on this show, wait till you hear me for 20 hours reading the book. <laughs> um, so go order it now. It's been very interesting and, ex and exciting to read it. I'm trying to read it with actual feeling and emotion without making it so over the top that people want to run out of the room. So um, <laughs> it's an interesting experiment. Give it a I'm, I'm sure once it's out, you'll be able to hear a snippet of it or something. But anyway, I'm sorry, I, I stepped on your question. No, that's great. I'm glad you uh, brought that up because for folks driving in their car, they have a long commute. That's perfect. 
that's it. And I'm trying to read it so you won't fall asleep while you're driving. <laughs> Just the opposite. I'm hoping it will it will um, make you wide awake and perky. <laughs> <laughs> so with this biography of Stan, what are you bringing to the table? What is new? What is special about it? Because other people have written books, but this is your take on it. You would think there are a lot of books about Stan. There have been, but mine, um, I didn't plan it this way. I've been actually working on it for years. Although when he did die, my editor suggested I might want to hurry up. There have been many books that cover various aspects of Stan, including the Stanley Universe that Roy Thomas and I did for Tomorrow's back in 2011. And that's really a compendium of interviews and rare artifacts from his archives. And, you know, this is a totally different book, if anybody was wondering. This is really the first traditional biography of Stan that's come out since his death. Uh, there was another one that came out a few years ago that, for better or worse, was from an academic press that didn't get a lot of attention so I think mine is the first one from a major press, from someone who knew Stan, worked with him. I had access to him. It's an unauthorized biography. Nobody had to approve it except my editor and me. But Stan did uh, sit for two lengthy interviews for it. And I've interviewed uh, about 50 different people, uh, Neil Adam, Jerry Robinson, before he died. Uh, <laughs> it'd be hard to interview him after he died. Ken Bald, who was uh, an old friend and an associate of Stan's and Stan's best friend his whole life. Mark Evanier, who was Jack Kirby's biographer. Roy Thomas, Alan Bellman, Bruce J. Friedman, who was, of course, Drew Friedman's father. And Bruce was a famous novelist and screenwriter. Uh, 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 you know, on his own, and he worked with Stan. Bruce was an editor for Martin Goodman, who was the owner of Marvel Comics in the beginning, and Friedman worked for him. So I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people, and I have worked with Stan and knew him. I don't claim I was his best buddy, but we had a very good and cordial working relationship. I um, was his moderator at many convention panels in recent years. You know, although, of course, no one can or will ever do exactly what Stan did as an editor and writer at Marvel for many years, I think I have some insight into the kinds of decisions and conflicts and storytelling that Stan himself uh, was involved with. So I think like with my other books, if any of your listeners know of Superman on the Couch or Disguised as Clark Kent, those were books I wrote about different aspects of comics uh, and superheroes about 10 years ago or so. You know, I bring an insider's point of view, someone who knows how the sausages are made, as the saying goes, someone who understands why and how certain decisions were made, certain comics came out, characters were treated as they were, why the kinds of conflicts that Stan may have gotten into with his creative partners like Kirby and Ditko, and maybe some insight into why those misunderstandings developed and how... You know, one thing I've been very pleased about, I've been reviewed Publishers Weekly and Psychology Today, and we had the front page of the NPR website and the Times of London. It's been reviewed a lot, and uh, the reviews have mostly been very good. But what I'm most pleased about is when the reviews discuss and say that I give an even-handed treatment to Stan's relationship with his creative collaborators. I worked hard to do that. I tried to not make a book that's a hagiography. I really wanted it to be, I don't know if you call it warts and all, but to show when Stan made decisions that maybe weren't the best decisions he could have made or where he wasn't the superhero you know, of the story. I wanted to give a rounded view of someone. Well, I think it's still clear that I admire him and his accomplishments. I didn't want to do just sort of a bland... Isn't Stan a cute old man and don't we love his cameos? You know, I really go in depth into his past. I go in depth into his childhood. You know, I think the thing that I thought I would gloss over, but it turned out I couldn't and didn't, was his early years, both before he went to work in comics, which he did at age 17, and then the 20 years in comics preceding Fantastic Four number one. Because I thought, well, you know, people I'm sure will mostly be interested in the creation of those characters and then his Hollywood years and then some of the craziness that went on around him in the last few years that was literally in all the papers, unfortunately. Um, you know, so I go into that. But those 20 years where Stan was 
presiding over maybe the largest by volume publisher of comic books in the country. Everybody thinks of Marvel as this little company that started in the early 60s. And it had become that because of various business and political things that went on that caused it to implode in the late 50s. But for most of the 40s and 50s, timely Atlas Marvel, which names were used interchangeably, I think it might have been the biggest or the second biggest producer of comics in the United States. Stan was presiding over other editors as well as editing himself, but over a line of comics that was 75 or 80 monthly titles. And I'd been at Marvel in the 80s and 90s through some crazy kind of growth and then imploding then too. So it's interesting how history repeats itself and what Stan's role in that and how he was treated by the different corporate entities that own the company. And you know, if there's one kind of myth about Stan I'd love to dispel, is the idea that he owned the company and owned the characters. He didn't. So although he was the editor-in-chief and the publisher and had all these corporate titles over the years, in some ways he was always a highly paid employee, but an employee nonetheless, while he seemed to be wealthy. and I never saw his bank account or his brokerage account, but he seemed to be wealthy. I don't think he was as wealthy as some people thought that someone that prominent and that intimately connected to Marvel would be. He was not an owner of the company or the characters, which a lot of people are surprised to find out. You know, he wasn't flashing his wealth. He just wanted to promote the books, promote the characters, and do something. And he was always very, very active. You outlined very much in your book all the projects he was working on, even when he wasn't working in the comics, per se. He was always working on properties, new creations. Well, don't forget, he was a child of the greatest generation. His family was poor even before the Depression. <laughs> when the crash of 29 happened, uh, it didn't help. You know, His father was chronically un under or unemployed, and his mother was the housewife who didn't work. And she passed away when Stan was in his 20s, relatively young. So Stan was depended on very early to not just uh, help his family, but really, the way he put it, was to support his family. They might have had some help from relatives that Stan didn't know about, but he felt this great responsibility to be out and earning money from a very early age. And I think he also had seen the comics industry implode and Marvel, you know, implode a couple of times. So, A, comics was a very disreputable field to be in. It's hard to imagine that now when comics are so high profile and the characters are so uh, world famous and lucrative. But it was almost like being in pornography, being in comics then. So, you know, I think if you were someone who was talented in some aspect of comics from Stan's generation, you wanted a comic strip, and a syndicated newspaper comic strip, because those guys, people like Al Cap and Chester Gould and uh, Charles Schultz, those guys, they lived and were treated like rock stars. You know, I think Stan had a comfortable position. He had a day job, and he could do as much freelance as he wanted uh, writing, but he had seen his company literally disappear a couple of times, and he grew up in that kind of depression. Anything could disappear at any moment. So he never stopped hustling with a hundred different things. I mean, the ones I list in the book are just some of them, always busy with something, always pitching something. And I think he enjoyed it, too. People would ask him, why don't you retire? You know, Why do you keep uh, running around and flying to conventions? And you know, he would say, well, look, people retire to do what they want to do. But I'm doing what I want to do, so why should I? Please don't make me retire. And he loved the action. He loved being needed. He loved being valued. He loved that people valued him both creatively and as someone who could generate income. You know, I think he measured success a lot by that, although he always also was very eager to get home to be with his wife, Joan, who he was married to for almost 70 years. He was a complicated guy. I just think by nature and by experience, he was determined to kind of not put all his apples in one basket. He was determined that he would not be dependent on any one source of income. Danny, it's a great book, and I read it cover to cover, and it's very comprehensive, very enjoyable to read. Everything is also placed into context of the times as things are happening and as we go through Stan's life. But there were two things in particular that struck me about the book. 
that I wanted to point out, and one of them you've already mentioned, and you'll be glad to hear this, is that you very even-handedly handled the co-creator credit and how things were created. I mean, you weren't there, and no one really knows how the back and forth went because it all happened spontaneously, quickly, and they didn't realize what they had, but... It's very fair how everyone's point of view, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, it's all laid out there for the reader to decide. Thank you. You know, I don't think it takes anything away from Stan's achievements or his talent to say that he worked with other people who were incredibly talented as well. And he was able to make the most of that synergy between them, you know, but without Lee, Ditko, or Kirby, and I think in a lot of ways without Martin Goodman, you know, his contribution is sort of a little vaguer in history, but I think without any of them, but certainly without Stan, Jack, and Steve, you know, without any one of them, there is no Marvel. And the other thing that I really found interesting that I'd never really thought about is how Peter Parker's Spider-Man reflected a lot of things in Stan's own life. And if I may, I'd just like to read an excerpt from the book. Giving Peter a nemesis, who is a periodical publisher, One who is egotistical and manipulative and changes his mind on a dime was the perfect fodder for Lee to satirize publishing in general, Martin Goodman in particular, and even himself as boss. One way or another, the adolescent at the core of Peter Parker and of Stan Lee wasn't ever forgotten. The saga of Spider-Man is the story of a young man living in a bubble of love that is shattered suddenly and traumatically, who must then deal with the simultaneous multiple repercussions of such an all-too-real event. Peter must deal with his uncle's death, for which he blames himself, the way a child of an unemployed father might blame himself for the family's woes, and the financial needs of his elderly aunt, as well as her ongoing medical crisis, echoing, arguably, Lee's mother's battle with the cancer that ultimately took her life, Peter Parker's life in trauma upon trauma, an echo of Stan's and Larry's own difficult journey. I thought that was a tremendous insight, and that's one of the great things about this book. Thank you. I'm glad you picked that. The funny thing is, I literally recorded that section yesterday for the <laughs> audiobook, so it's funny to like hear you know, somebody else's voice uh, reading. You did a very good reading, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I may I may call on you to come in and uh, maybe fill in any uh, any places in the book where I haven't done so great. <laughs> yeah, no, that thank you. I think that was the appeal of the Marvel characters. They had dimension, and then to sort of know about the characters. I think elsewhere in the chapter, or certainly elsewhere in the book, uh, I talk about how kind of high school is this great metaphor for adult life and for life in the United States and America in a lot of ways, and that Ditko brought a lot of his high school experience to it as well. You know, this is a generation of guys who are obviously smart, obviously talented, but for reasons of either finances or just not being particularly interested in academics, they did not go to college. Although, you know, if you've met or spoken to any of them, you can see they're clearly bright enough to have breezed through college. But they didn't. They needed or wanted to go to work. They were artistic. They weren't inclined to be students. So for them, high school became what for a lot of people say college is. People remember fondly going to uh, whatever their alma mater was. So I think it was very formative for that generation, especially that generation in comics. So Ditko, too, had, I think, some very formative high school experiences. And I think they both, in Spider-Man, you know, even if Ditko was plotting, which I think he did starting after about the first year and a half or two years, they were pretty much Ditko's plots, but some of the conflict between them seems to be that Ditko would maybe draw a story in one way, but Stan would then script it in a way that wasn't what Steve had intended or wouldn't be how Steve wanted it said, which I think was one of the many touch points of conflict between them. But, you know, that's why I say in the book, these guys collaborated and did their best work sometimes because of the other one and sometimes in spite of the other one. You know, you don't have to love the person you're working with, although I think at times Lee and Ditko did love each other, and I think the book goes into kind of their complicated relationship and its evolution. I think they had more in common than they thought, even though they each saw each other as almost diametrically opposite each other. And by the late 90s, Ditko was writing some very uncomplimentary things about Stan and his various writings. They had an intense professional, you know, I don't think they hung out. I don't think Steve was a hanging out kind of guy. And Stan really wasn't 
so much either. But I think there was some kind of connection between them that resulted in the intensity of Spider-Man and Peter Parker. That was different than the joys and passion that Stan did with Kirby. I'm really glad you read that excerpt. It's really a very meaningful thing. It sort of also developed some things I started talking about in Superman on the Couch, which if uh, anyone has read that, that was my first book back in 2004. Obviously, by its title, you can tell it's sort of a psychologically oriented thing. I think I bring that to the table of books that I write, and I think Marvel's characters really lend themselves to that because I think, consciously or not, you know, that was really Marvel's revolution, you know, and what Stan did with his partners. One of the big things was adding depth to the characters, whereas in the superhero comics by other companies before Marvel, you could really interchange dialogue balloons from character to character and not really know the difference. Stan uh, was so conscious that he wanted to do comics that had more depth, and that was really along with the great artwork and the interesting uh, storylines. DC Comics of the era were much more plot-driven. They were based on Batman finding a piece of mud that had stuck to the cuff of, a, of somebody's shoe, and through that, you know, he examines it under the microscope, and that leads him to where the Joker is hiding. You know, and that's all well and good, and those stories are enjoyable, too. But I think Stan was less interested in that clump of mud and more interested in what went on in the hearts and minds of his characters. So the book is A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee by Danny Fingeroth. And there's still time to get it before Christmas, whether you go into your (laughs) bookstore, whether you go online and buy it. If you want to wait for the audio, that's fine, but you really want to get a copy of this because I have to go through and highlight things, and I'll go back and read this again and again for information because it's such a good read. You have a hard time putting it down. If you have a few moments, Danny, I have to go over my kicking back with the creator questions, just fun questions I ask all my guests to learn more about you as a person. Okay, so let's see what you got, and I hope I'm not too disappointing as a person once people hear the answers. (laughs) What do you like to do, Danny, for rest and relaxation? Wow, I should be ready for these questions. I like to go to the movies. I like to go to restaurants. I like to spend time with my wife. I am something of a yoga aficionado. That's part of my workout routine. Nothing particularly exotic. No hang gliding, you know, no (laughs) sheer rock climbing. I live in New York, but I, like many native New Yorkers, I rarely get to go and do all that, you know, all that great theater and museums. And I know all about him, but... (laughs) I know. I'm here in Las Vegas, and I rarely get downtown to the Strip. I'm, like, in the burbs. (laughs) I don't have a collection of things that are, like, themed with frogs or... (laughs) Movies, restaurants, and spending time with friends and family, and exercising so that, you know, that, like, the physical plant in reasonably uh, good condition. Thinking back, what was your favorite birthday? Wow. I'll pick my sixth birthday. The same reason that, say, you know, Hanukkah or Christmas, when you're a little kid, are great, because it's uncomplicated. It's my birthday. I'm going to get toys, and my friends are all going to, like, eat cake and sing happy birthday. I'm sort of getting, like, kind of a general image of my childhood birthday parties, which for all I know could be a total rewriting of history in my brain. It it could have been they were as angst-ridden as anything. But just the idea that when you're a kid, it's just like, oh, it's going to be a day and everybody's going to be nice to me and dolly cake and get gifts. That's, you know, I guess to go back to your first question, which I guess you asked what I do to relax. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. Since Dylan played for 10 days in New York and I went to two shows, I guess I probably spend uh, more brain space and recreation space listening to and thinking about Bob Dylan than most people should. I want to be sure that if whoever's writing my biography, because, you know, that'll be a big moneymaker, I want to be sure that people know where to start looking and do their research. Okay. <laughs> Hypothetical situation. If you were stuck on a deserted island, <laughs> you will get rescued at some point, so survival's not going to be an issue. But what is the one book you want to have with you to read for pleasure? Something to take your mind off the situation. So obviously something I've read before, I guess. It could be, or it could be something you're meaning to get to, you just don't have the time. That's kind of risky, though, on that desert island. Right now, a book that I want to reread for numerous reasons is Dylan's Chronicles, uh, Volume 1. That was his memoir from about 15 years ago, which is a great read. I don't think at the end of it, I knew much more about Bob Dylan than I did at the beginning of it, because he's a guy who loves to be mysterious and keep his 
past kind of shrouded. But it was a great read just about aspects of his life. That's something I'm actually wanting to read again. And I would throw in maybe the first 50 issues of Fantastic Four. I'd like to reread that too. Ah, very good. Very good. Another hypothetical. Marvel is going to make an action figure of you. <laughs> what is your accessory? <laughs> Um, well, it depends if it's the action figure of me, the editor, or me, the writer. Uh, if it's me, the editor, I've always thought that to a freelancer, a comic book editor, or any editor, I guess, but a comic book editor is really just a giant hand with a pen in it to sign their vouchers <laughs> attached to like a teeny body. So if it was the editor, Danny, it would be like a giant hand with a pen in it attached to a teeny body. If it was Danny the writer, it was, I guess it would be a, a laptop. A computer would be the accessory. Now back to reality. When you're resting <laughs> and relaxing, what is your beverage of choice? Uh, seltzer. Sometimes I'll go crazy and have like a lemon-lime seltzer, but uh, yeah, seltzer is definitely the go-to beverage. Okay, part of the healthy lifestyle, the yoga, the seltzer. Yeah, but don't believe a word. You know, it, <laughs> <laughs> that's just the public consumption, okay. the lifestyle. I wish it was healthier. Okay, now a little more philosophical. What do you wish you knew when you were younger that you know now? Something you could say to your younger self, you know, let me tell you something. This will save you a lot of pain and grief. That most things are not worth worrying or over-worrying, which will contradict something else I'm about to say. Because one of the most important lessons, which I have to say goes back to something Jim Shooter used to say, that was sort of a lesson that our comics portray or should portray, is that actions have consequences. If you're lucky, you can live a life where you think there are a lot of do-overs or the things you do can be gone back on or taken back. And some things can but you can't get back time, and your actions have consequences that you often can't see till way down the road, which sounds just the opposite of don't sweat the details and don't over-worry things. But I guess if you take those two together, it's saying try to have some balance in your life. Don't not think about things, but don't overthink things. That would be a plea for balance from my older self to my younger self. How do you want to be remembered? <sighs> <laughs> and I'm not saying you're done. I'm just saying... Yeah, yeah. Because I wonder myself, how do I want to be remembered? Well, how do you want to be remembered? Professionally, personally? Just as Danny. God, that is too monumental a question. I'd like to be remembered as someone who tried to do the right thing and succeeded a lot of the time. <laughs> you know, um, not all the time, but sort of tried to be a positive force in people's lives and professionally maybe i told some decent stories that uh, the people uh, got a kick out of and my final question who was stanley to you stanley was the person who in many ways made the career i've had for my entire adult life and the hobby i had for my childhood and adolescence possible so he was a genius with uh, a bunch of flaws. The Stan Lee that I knew as a 12-year-old in the comics was this person who made me feel special because I read Marvel comics and made me feel that I was in on some incredible secret. Even though I knew there were millions of other people reading the comics, he managed to add a lot of color and flavor to my childhood and he made my career possible you know he was someone who i had a cordial friendly relationship and a mutually respectful relationship with as an adult as a fellow comics professional i think a lot of stan's stories influenced my whole worldview and probably does to this day that in all our lives there are heroes and villains, but the heroes are not perfect and the villains are not 100% evil. You know, he provided a template for living a meaningful life, even if he himself didn't always live up to the ideals he established. But artists never do. The artist and the creator's job 
is to sort of provide a goal for everyone to reach, including themselves. I think Stan meant both the real and the imaginary Stan Lee were very important and are very important to my life. Author Danny Fingeroff of A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee. Danny, thank you so much for being on Career Talks. Thank you, Chris. These were great questions, and uh, it was a pleasure to do this interview. All right. I hope you enjoyed this early release of my interview with Danny Fingeroth. And I'll probably have one more interview scheduled before the end of the year on December 26th. Regular listeners of the show know that this month I've had two people working in comics for a long time, both Don Glute and Danny Fingeroth. My next guest will be Emily Pearson. She has done work for Black Mask Studios, including The Wilds and Snap Flash Hustle. She's also done work for Action Labs was a contributor to two anthologies, Corpus and Everything is Going Wrong, comics on punk and mental illness. And she also has work coming out in 2020 through Scout Comics. So please join us for that conversation on December 26th. And I want to give a shout out to an up and coming creator. J.D. Calderon has an Indiegogo campaign currently in progress for the Oswald Chronicles Passing Queens 1 through 3. The premise, what if the greatest sorcerer of our time were to be born in the body of a mouse? So if you want to check it out, just go to Indiegogo and look for the Oswald Chronicles Passing Queens 1 through 3 or J.D. Calderon. Thank you for listening to the show this week. If you haven't listened before, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is free. You can also rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. That is greatly appreciated, as always. Think of it as a Christmas present for me if you leave a rating or review. The show is also available on Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, Spotify, and voice-enabled devices. You can see what I'm up to between shows on social media. That's Greater Talks Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I also post on the weekends my Saturday Silver Age and Sunday Bronze Age comics from my collection. When possible, I try to tie it into my guests' work. When not possible, well, it might just be something that I'm currently reading and enjoying. What are you reading and enjoying? Please share on social media with me and the rest of my followers. If you want to reach me directly, you can through my email address, creatortalks at gmail. That's creatortalks at gmail. I wish you and yours a happy holidays. May you have a great holiday season and receive some comics for Christmas. Thank you for listening for Creator Talks. This has been Christopher Calloway. Until next time.